The subject tonight is both compelling and sober, and that is that? crimes and memory of crimes and how we preserve those memories. <coughs> Professor Waxman begins his comprehensive history of concentration camp with a quotation from a letter found in a flask in Auschwitz. May the world at least behold a drop, a fraction of this tragic world in which we lived. And throughout his book there are examples of the tension between the need of survivors to forget and the desire to bear witness, between the search for meaning and the dream of indifference. The philosopher Abishai Margalit asks, so what should humanity remember? The short answer is striking examples of radical evil and crimes against humanity. The source of this obligation arises in response to the effort of radical evil forces to undermine morality itself by rewriting the past and controlling a collective memory. And to properly remember, we need documentary records, especially when survivors may no longer be present to remind us. Archives are where they are stored, and without archives, there could be no historical reconstruction. Those are the subject matters, in part, that will be covered by the talk, talks by Professor Waxman and by Albert Canova, our honoree. In my introductory remarks, I merely want to explain why we decided to celebrate one of those professions that we all know about, but we take for granted. If you think of, say, a Pulitzer Prize or the National Book Award, you can readily understand the work being honored. But when you think of an archivist, it is hard to link him or her to a specific project. Robert Caro, one of our initial speakers and someone who encouraged this award, in his book, The Master of, of the Senate, a section simply entitled Deaths refers to Claudia Anderson, and I quote, Claudia is a senior archivist at the LBJ Library, a title which does not adequately do justice to her abilities or to her significance in the study of American history. She knows, she has made it her business to know the archival material in her charge as thoroughly as it is possible for a single person to know those thousands of boxes of documents. And she wants historians, and through them, history and the world, to know that material. History's knowledge of Johnson will be richer for her help. That praise is certainly applic applicable to many other archivists. And if this type of assistance, was, as well described by Bob, was the only reason for the award, <coughs> we might be tempted to sing out Dai Dai Enu. But there are many other reasons as well. As originally conceived, the award was to be a lecture dedicated to the honoree by a writer whose works benefited from our <coughs> research. It did not take long, however, to realize that goal was somewhat of a conceit and rather narrow. Honoring devoted professionals with a lecture did not feel substantially different than an acknowledgment at the front or the back of the book. And we soon understood that their work had a much broader impact than, than merely acting as an essential resource for historians. And so the format changed. The recipient was invited to give the principal talk and in effect became his or her own prize. I can only give a few examples of the impact of archives and archival research this evening because there are many good speakers and I don't want to take the time. John Taylor, our first honoree, was the perfect prototype for this award. He taught us that this ceremony should be a springboard, a departure for a wide-ranging discussion of issues facing a democratic society. John died a few years ago at the age of 87, completing his 63rd year at the National Archives. He became an expert in intelligence and military documentation, and some 800 books cite his name in acknowledgments. He claimed he got hooked on his work by walking into the stacks on his first day and was overcome by that special odor emanating from archival records. In those days, you were able to receive originals instead of photocopies or microfilm, so there was a real smell of centuries of history, a musty odor 
that John claimed was really the smell of accountability, of history rendering judgment. And he reminded me in our conversations that the Declaration of Independence, the fourth article of complaint against King George, was that he made it difficult for Americans to gain access to the depository of their public records. And he quoted James Madison that without free access, without the means of acquiring information, there could be no effective democratic government. And he was fearful that we were heading toward what he called the factless society, as we witnessed performances by presidential candidates and TV commentators. And given certain comments uh, from foreign leaders, maybe we could add them to that list. <laughs> When President Bush issued an executive order allowing each member of the executive branch to decide which of his or her papers were to be classified <coughs> and thus unavailable to the public, Vice President Cheney made the most of this. And just in case he forgot to put the classified stamp on one of his papers, he argued that he was exempt from the law on the theory that he was really a member of the legislative branch since he presided over the Senate. <laughs> Taylor led the protest. Marine Dow wrote, I love that Cheney was able to bu bully Colin Powell, Pentagon generals, and George Tenet, but when he tried to push around the little guys, the National Archive wonky types with glasses, they pushed back and won. <laughs> and if we could, we would have honored Winston Smith, Orwell's character in 1984. Smith was an archivist, you may recall, in the Ministry of Truth. His job was to rewrite historical documents so they would match the current party line. And is there any wonder that the brief period of openness in Russia is now closed as a result of KGB visits to archival facilities? And so we began to think of the archivist as the canary in the mine to alert us when democracy falters as a result of state interference either to censor, withhold documents, or otherwise restrict access to national memories. It is the archivist who will be the first to know, and some might even argue that Daniel El Ellsberg and perhaps even Edward Snowden should be classified <laughs> as, uh, as honorary archivists. Mm -hmm. There's another reason as, as to. But let, let me, I'm going to skip towards the end because uh, this, the, the speeches from, from Nick Waxman and Alvin Canola are so interesting that I'd rather uh, go on to one point and lead, the, lead into their introduction. Access to archival material does not necessarily mean that truth will out. Interpretation of documents will vary, or in some case be manipulated for political end. And that leads me to my last point, the <coughs> David Irving trial. You may recall that Deborah, Deborah Lipstadt, in her book, Denying the Holocaust, um, it, The Assault on Truth and Memory, accused David Irving, author of countless books, on Nazi Germany of being a quote, and I have to quote it otherwise he would sue me, Hitler partisan who distorted evidence. In short, he was a Holocaust denier. According to Irving, Hitler never gave extermination orders and had not known about that program until late 1943. Nor, Irving insisted, were there gas chambers at Auschwitz. More people died in Edward Kennedy's back seat, he claimed, than by gas chambers and so on. <laughs> Irving sued Lipstadt and her publisher in England for defamation, as he did other authors. He had a long history of threats against authors, and usually he succeeded in having their books pulled from the shelf in England to avoid the lengthy trials. Unlike the rules in this country, Lipstadt had to prove her statements were true. Professor Waxman was one of the leading researchers for the defense, and I'm sure he'll say a few words about that trial. I just want to point out the relationship of that trial to the work of archivists. Irving built his reputation as a master of archives. When confronted with the question that his arguments were contrary to most historians, he responded, they can't prove their <coughs> points. I can prove all my points because I've got all the documents. I once heard a comparable statement. Some of you know that I once owned the film rights to the life of Albert Speer and spent some time with him. He had a very neat office. There was not a paper on his desk. He was, and if you asked him a question, he'd go to a file drawer and pull out a document. 
And when I asked him how can he prove his lack of knowledge of what was going on in the camps, he would point to the file cabinets and say, I have the documents. But there are limits to selectivity and manipulation of documents, and that is the lesson of the Irving trial. Richard Evans, a key expert witness, later wrote that the trial was about the creation of historical knowledge, that is, about archival material and how it was to be used. It was less a direct question of the Holocaust than the falsification of the historical record that Lipstadt alleged Irving had committed. If Irving had won, of course, he would have exploited the victory to place doubt on the Holocaust. Lipstadt <coughs> kept the diary of the trial and published a book, History on Trial, soon to be a film starring Hilary Swank. In it, she recounts in dramatic fashion certain key moments in the trial. I'll mention just one. I can imagine the scene, <coughs> Irving the plaintiff in the dock, his own expert witness and his own lawyer, rather arrogant, still insisting that Hitler was not responsible for mass killings. To counter Irving's arguments, Richard Rampton, Lipstadt's barrister, slowly extracted a document from his files and showed it to Irving. It was a report sent to Hitler listing the number of Jews executed at a specific moment in time. Irving responded that Hitler may have looked at it, but if he had, it would have been only as a footnote as he had bigger things on his plate. The judge commented that the document showed the execution of 300,000 Jews. Well, you have to be quite a man, continued Lord Grey, not to notice 300,000 civilians being executed. Evans, in his own book on the trial, concluded that Irving's <coughs> arguments crumpled under the simple weight of facts, archival facts. In her book, Lipstadt thanked and expressed gratitude her to her lawyers for their brilliant effort. Nowhere is there a mention of the archivist that preserved and supplied the documents, but this evening will. I first learned about Nick Waxman's book, reading the reviews in various publications. One such review was written by Roger Cohen in the New York Times, and Roger, an eloquent vo voice in this uncertain period, agreed to interrupt his travels in Lebanon or wherever to introduce the author. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Stanley. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I, I'd interrupt my travels anywhere for you, Stanley. Uh, with respect to uh, what Stanley was saying about recent events, and notably Dick Cheney, I noticed the spread of the worrying, at least to me, expression, fact-based reality, uh, as if there were any other kind of reality. But plenty of people um, think that such other realities exist, both in this country and elsewhere. And that's a reminder, I think, of the importance of this occasion. Um, I'm a journalist. Um, I've been um, deeply concerned with um, the intersection of the past and the present, because, quite simply, I don't believe you can understand the present um, if you don't try to understand the events that have led to it. And um, this perception, um, not very original or deep, uh, was rammed home to me, nonetheless, in, in very in a very vivid way, uh, by my experience of covering the war in Bosnia. Uh, the war in Bosnia, like many wars, was a, a myth-based war. Uh, it was because uh, when he took over um, control of Yugoslavia after World War II, it was because Tito had completely suppressed uh, the war within a war uh, that happened in Yugoslavia during World War II, uh, that when the lid began to come off the dictatorship uh, in Yugoslavia, that all the hatreds uh, between Bosnia and, they weren't millennial hatreds, a lot of them only went back 30 or 40 years to specific things that had happened in specific families uh, that had been repressed. And, um, and so it became very clear to me, for example, that you know, the Serbs believed they were still fighting the Ottoman Turks in the form of the secular Muslims uh, of Bosnia. Everybody was deluded, and the suppression of history, the suppression of facts, uh, played a large part in um, those illusions 
uh, taking form and then feeding uh, the terrible war that I covered. Um, I'll just add that I've been, um, I spent a long time researching a family memoir that I published uh, early this year called The Girl from Human Street, and it was, it's really a Jewish odyssey of the 20th century, but it's partly concerned with my mother's uh, manic depressive illness, and that had begun with a postpartum depression, then called post puerperal psychosis in the 1950s, and she disappeared for two years into psychiatric institutions, and I had no idea what had happened to her, so I wrote um, the Britain's Freedom of Information Act to the National Health Service in Britain to see if by any chance there were any records of my mother's uh, spell in psychiatric hospitals in the 1950s. And everything was gone, everything had been lost, everything had been destroyed, except for one fragment uh, covering her ward history uh, for three weeks in 1958. Uh, and thanks to that, um, this fragment, this <coughs> single piece of paper uh, preserved in some National Health Archive, uh, I was able to discover um, that, for example, two days before my third birthday, my mother was having electroconvulsive uh, treatment in 1958 on July 31 in uh, the Holloway Institution just outside London. And so a fragment, a piece of paper, a document preserved can change individual memory, individual psychology, uh, as well as the history of entire nations. And therein, I think, lies um, its enormous importance. Um, now, uh, Professor Nick Waxman, uh, who is here with us tonight, uh, has written a really um, extraordinary book in <coughs> Kael Concentrationslager, A History of the Nazi Camps. Um, and it's extraordinary not only for its remarkable thoroughness and the way it sheds light on something perhaps we thought we already knew, but also for, and I think above all, uh, for the remarkable human texture uh, that Nick is able to bring this account through his remarkable research uh, in the archives of Dachau, where I want to read tonight. Um, works and, and also elsewhere. Um, I don't think any uh, criminal operation left um, as much evidence, um, mountains of it, as uh, Tom Lacour put it in his review in the London Review of Books, of the book, uh, as the concentration camps. And Nick's extraordinary um, achievement is to have worked through all this and found, you know, what moves us. It's not it's so often it, the human detail that makes <coughs> history come alive, that makes us understand things. And it's in the kind of fragments I described, I think, whether in journalism or in history, that one finds that kind of detail. And I was struck that both uh, like her and I myself, in our review, from all these 850 pages of this uh, remarkable book that chronicles the collapse of a whole society, a whole civilization, from the doctors conducting monstrous experiments to the soldiers uh, looting corpses. Um, we chose from those 850 pages to focus on one survivor, a certain Moritz Koinowski. Um, and um, Koinowski's story was extraordinary. He was first imprisoned at Buchenwald, uh, then um, at Auschwitz, which he survived, surviving, I think, at least two, maybe three selection processes. Then being force march, death march, back to Grosshausen, and ending up in Dachau. And Nick tells this story in, in remarkable fashion. And there's such detail that um, Lacan and I chose to dwell on two different pieces of detail. He, on the fact that at Dachau, <coughs> after all this, after having survived hell, murderous hell, um, Kornowski is treated in Dachau for an ear infection two weeks before uh, he was liberated. And I focused on a phrase that he uttered um, while he was being looked after by the liberators, the Allied liberators of Dachau. And he said, 
is this possible? And this phrase was recorded. And it struck me as such an extraordinary phrase because what was he asking? Is it possible that I survived? Is it possible that all this happened? Is it possible that I am now receiving this care? Is it possible that a generous humanity still exists? And it is thanks to his painstaking research in the archives that I think Nick was able to make these human stories uh, come al alive in a way that, as I said, illuminates a story um, of the concentration camps, the 27 concentration camps, Concentrationslager, uh, that are at the heart of the book. And of course, those Concentrationslager are at the very core of the story of the Third Reich. Um, Dachau is where he begins his book. It's where Albert Knoll works. Um, and Dachau is where he ends his books. Dachau was the first of the camps and um, Rudolf Hoss, who became commandant at Auschwitz, uh, began uh, his career, if you like, as a sentry at Dachau in 1934. And it's extraordinary to follow in the book the way this core of Germans, born, uh, most of them, around the turn of the century, going through the humiliation of defeat in World War I, and then with those burning resentments into what became the chaos and confusion of the Weimar Republic. It's fascinating psychological portrait that's another important aspect of the book. We see how men like Hoss moved through the ranks and also moved from camps like Dachau um, that, of course, were not uh, death camps to a death camp like Auschwitz and how uh, complete power uh, to be repressive became, in turn, complete power to com commit mass murder. Once the moral line had been crossed, uh, that progression uh, proved easy. Um, it's a remarkable book. It's wonderful that we have you with us here this evening, Nick. Um, you know, we think we know so often. We think we know what happened before. But when we look more closely, uh, we find that we don't. And Nick's book is a remarkable illustration of what archives can reveal about even subjects that we think we know well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Thank you, Stanley, for the invitation. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, which sets the bar um, rather higher than I would have hoped. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> the book is okay. <laughs> um, I, when Stanley first contacted me to, to speak tonight, um, I was delighted to accept, and I, I, I was delighted for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is um, because archivists really are the unsung, uh, unsung heroes of historical research, and they deserve huge respect for the work they do. Without archivists, historians like myself would navigate in the blind. Um, and they don't deserve the credit, uh, they don't get the credit they deserve. Um, it's very odd, historians really think about the way archives work and operate. How collections are created, how collections are preserved, how they're organized. In fact, we really think about the fact that Archives, just like history, is, are constructed. I mean, there's a lot of historical theory about the construction of history. But archives are no different if we start thinking about collection policy and so on. Most historians, it seems to me, treat archives as a place where they, and I include myself here, uh, where they turn up, they hope they can mine as much as they can in a few days, uh, with the archivists kind of serving them the documents they ordered. And this mindset was summed up more than four decades ago by W.K. Lamb, a president of the Canadian Historical Association, who said, and I quote, uh, that archivists essentially are seen by historians as hacks, quote, hewers of wood um, and drawers of water. The archivist collects things, cleans them, catalogues them, puts them on shelves, 
and eventually takes some of them off the shelves and puts them on a table when a historian wants them. Does that sound familiar, Alba? Yeah. Um, <laughs> all this, Lamb continues, is true enough, but it neglects entirely those aspects of the archivist's job that calls for intelligence, knowledge, and judgment to such a degree that the assignment can be a little frightening. So tonight is a wonderful occasion for all of us to honor the incredible and indispensable <coughs> work that archivists do. Another reason why I was delighted to speak to you tonight uh, is because um, I love archives. And uh, I got hooked on archives probably, um, you know, this isn't some kind of uh, 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 anonymous uh, archivists meeting where I stand up and say, I'm Nick and I'm addicted to archives. <laughs> um, but I still remember the first day I entered an archive as a student exactly 20 years ago. It was the State Archive in Munich, which Hubbard knows as well. And receiving my first order of files which arrived, I mean, Stanley just talked about the smell of the archive, and these were old files nobody had looked at for a long, long time, for decades. Blue, I remember, stacked together, bound by a, in a very intricate way with, with knots, which I spent a long time unknotting, and even longer trying to work out how to re-knot them. <laughs> and it was a bit like receiving a birthday present, in a way. You, kind of, you fill in your list of what you want, your wish list, um, you wait in great anticipation for your present to arrive. It finally comes to your table. You don't quite know what it's going to be. And then you lose yourself in the archive. Um, you, you, you lose yourself in the files. You're hoping to find a new trace, some kind of glimpse into the past. Of course, like real birthday presents, there are plenty of disappointments when you unwrap <laughs> these bundles. And uh, actually, on my first day in Munich, that's uh, what it turned out to be. Uh, what I found in this much anticipated bundle were a, a, a huge number of very extraordinarily boring <laughs> files on uh, arcane aspects of uh, 1920s Bavarian prison regulations. Um, I'm sure there's an after-dinner speech in there somewhere, but I'll spare you uh, for today, maybe afterwards. <laughs> that said, kind of actually sometimes a little aside, I mean sometimes even the most unpromising files Reveal great riches. Um, there is a, a, a holding of files, a record group, in the Hamburg State Archives, which are simply, or used to be simply labeled as reports without value. Um, and they actually turned out to be invaluable because what they included were reports by undercover Hamburg policemen uh, who dressed up as ordinary workers uh, around 1900 and frequented pubs and bars in Hamburg and listened secretly to what German workers were actually really talking about over their pints of beer. So sometimes it's worth ordering reports without value as well. <laughs> what first brought me to the archives 20 years ago was research for my then doctorate um, about law and terror in Weimar and Nazi Germany. The book was subsequently published as Hitler's prisons. Um, if you would all go out and buy a copy, we'd probably double the overall circulation. <laughs> <laughs> what, what interested me, what I tried to, how I got into this, was to, 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 to try to understand how, or try to investigate, and that hadn't really been done to that degree, how a legal system, a system based on the rule of law, uh, operates in a lawless state, in other words, how it transitions from the Weimar Republic, the first German experiment in democracy, to the Third Reich. And all the way through the Third Reich, you do have courts, you do have judges, you do have laws, and you have regular prisons. And actually, these prisons hold a lot more prisoners until the middle of the Second World War, then do concentration camps. So I was interested not just in the, the, the development of the system, but also in the prisoners themselves. Um, so a crucial part of the archival work I did was to try to get into the prison cells. And of course, most of these men and women didn't write memoirs after the war. Um, uh, and what I managed to find in these prisoner personnel files were censored letters, scraps of paper, notes, um, which nobody had looked at for 70-odd for, for years. And that made it possible up to a point to reconstruct 
the world of these prisoners. That kind of approach, that interest in the history of everyday life, uh, history from below, um, was certainly indebted up to a point to my academic supervisor at the time, Richard Evans, Sir Richard Evans, who we Stanley has already mentioned before, who was a great proponent. I uh, mean, he's, he's known here, if you've heard of him mainly, I think, for his role in the Irving trial and also for his three-volume history of the Third Reich. But actually, for the first half of his career, he was a, a very empirical historian living in the archives and writing remarkable books. Um, so it was that kind of, I think, that background which influenced me. But Richard also influenced me more directly in that it was through him I first started to work on the Holocaust uh, because he roped me in to the Irving trial uh, in the late 1990s. I remember meeting him in his office and he said, I've been asked to become the chief expert witness in this trial. Would you be kind of a researcher, kind of, you know, it's only going to take three or four weeks, it'd be fine, but it took two years in the end. <laughs> um, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a hugely important and influential um, uh, period for all of us. Um, the trial is, it, it's known as the Irving trial, but people call it the Irving trial, but that's actually a misnomer, because it's worth recalling, and Stanley alluded to it before, that it wasn't technically Irving who was on trial, it was Deborah Lipstadt who was on trial. Irving had sued her because she had, wrote, she had written in her book Denying the Holocaust that Irving was a Holocaust denier, and that meant that he manipulated history, falsified history, lied about Auschwitz, lied about Hitler. So our job, the defense job, was to call Irving out. And as Stanley said, um, that uh, meant going to the archives and beating Irving at his own game. I mean, he, he had an undoubted talent for ferreting out unknown documents, unusual documents. Uh, um, so we had to try and follow his path to the archives and see whether the records he cited actually um, bore out what he said. And the defense made a, the, the defense kind of the, the, the heads of the defense team, um, Richard Rampton um, as the QC, but also Anthony Julius um, as the barrister, made a call very early on that they weren't going to call survivors into the witness stand. And I think that decision was made above all so that, they, that Irving wouldn't get a chance as an avowed anti-Semite to um, put these uh, uh, witnesses through hell on the witness stand. Um, so the decision was made not to call survivors, but to base the defense on the historical record. And that meant for us starting the discovery process where both sides open up their papers and their own archives, if you will, to each other, um, so that we can, so that each side can go through um, the record. Interestingly or oddly enough, um, that process initially took place in David Irving's flat um, in Mayfair, um, a very posh, big flat, and it was a very uncomfortable place to work for a historian. It was me and another researcher and a, um, a lawyer, and we had to go turn up at Irving's flat, uh, ring the bell, he would kind of call us up, and in a typical British way, I mean, I can't imagine that would happen elsewhere, you know, you kind of chit-chat, you would put a you know, tea or coffee, you know, yes. and then you would sit down and start going through his correspondence with notorious uh, neo-Nazis and Holocaust deniers. Um, <laughs> we, we did kind of gather documents from a huge variety of different archives around the world. Um, the Israeli authorities released uh, previously un- seen um, writings by Eichmann, which we used in the trial. I also had a bit of a hobby horse late on. Um, I, I was convinced that I had a smoking gun which proved that Irving had lied in court. Um, but in order to prove that, I had to get original copies of the glass plates holding Goebbels' diaries in Moscow. You can imagine how easy that was. Um, but we got them, kind of, uh, much to my chagrin, I have to probably add, in the, given that we talk about historical truth here, that uh, Richard Rampton, the QC, kind of, in the end, took one look at my, kind of, paper about the Goebbels' diaries and said, nah. 
nah, kind of, it was too complicated, kind of, you know. I, I was sure I had Irving, but in the end, Brampton was right, of course, kind of, Irving had uh, already been caught out uh, on many occasions, and <coughs> the, the trial ended in a resounding victory for historical truth based on the work in the archives, and Irving got increasingly flustered during the trial. I mean, kind of, Stanley mentioned one uh, example, but kind of the one that sticks in my mind is uh, the moment when he, um, that was, it must have been late on, it's in, it's in the books, kind of, but it was late on in the trial where Irving was so flustered that he kind of, after an interruption from the judge, addressed the judge as mein Führer. <laughs> 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 and it's, it, it's at that point where kind of all of us kind of on the defense team looked at each other and we, we knew. <laughs> <laughs> we knew, we, knew we, we had him. The, um, the experience from, the, from that trial, um, and indeed kind of my work with some of the documents, then fed into my next project, which was that comprehensive history of the Nazi concentration camps, which appeared earlier this year. I worked on Nazi terror in, in a number of different ways for years already, and I was struck by the fact that there wasn't a comprehensive history. Um, <laughs> as you will all know, there are tens of thousands of, of memoirs, of scholarly articles, books, encyclopedias, monographs on specific aspects, specific camps, uh, individual prisoners, and so on, but there isn't or wasn't an overall account telling the story of the inmates and the perpetrators and the witnesses from beginning to end. And that's what I set out to do, and in a sense it's easy to say that, kind of, you know, the motivation behind this book was fairly straightforward. Um, writing it wasn't quite so straightforward. Um, as one prisoner writes in early 1945 in Sachsenhausen in his uh, secret diary, and I quote him early on in the book, uh, he says, and I quote, the language, I mean, he, he writes, he, his name is Odd Nansen, and uh, I've just heard that his, his diaries are being reissued next year, an extraordinary document, and completely unknown, a long, I mean, decades out of print um, in, in, in the US and in England. Um, and Odd Nansen chronicles, uh, in a very acute way, the crimes and the disease and <coughs> suffering in Sachsenhausen, and also what that does to a lot of his fellow inmates, even those who are better off. Um, and, so, and Nansen writes in early 1945, quote, the language is exhausted. He means his own language, his own ability of writing about these crimes. The language is exhausted. There are no words left to describe the horrors I've seen with my own eyes. And that's, of course, a question which I <coughs> had to face as well. I mean, how do you write about the camps? How do you capture crimes which seem to defeat language? And one way I decided early on to approach this was to try to make this not at all about me and not try to force readers into ways of feeling or thinking in certain ways, but to try as much as I could to let those who suffered the camps and who made the camps speak for themselves. So I wanted to give a voice to those who witnessed the camps. I didn't want the book to be abstract, uh, but about people and about people's feelings and thoughts at the time, not kind of retrospective. And this meant extensive archival work. Um, and I'm going to mention I could talk about this kind of for a long time, um, but I'll, I'll restrict myself to three main sources which are important here. The first one, uh, and there are some of those sources I looked at in Dachau, of course. Um, one important type of source um, is SS material, material generated by the perpetrators. SS terror isn't just, and wasn't, and never was, only about mindless violence and murder and terror. It was about that, but it was about more than that. There was also a huge bureaucracy of terror, with rules and circulars and regulations and directives and forms and stamps and so on. In Auschwitz, SS doctors complain later on in the war about cramps in their hands from having to sign all these death certificates. 
So they kind of invent a stamp in the end, so they don't design them themselves anymore. The special nature of terror in the camps derives precisely from the combination of bureaucratic terror and arbitrary daily violence. It's that duality which creates the unusual potency and dynamic of terror in the camps. Prisoners never know how and when and by whom they will be punished. And I'll give you an example of that, of, of what that means in practice. And I want to briefly look at Auschwitz. Auschwitz is the largest by far concentration camp and the deadliest concentration camp by far because it is the only concentration camp to play a major part in the Holocaust and the genocide of European Jewry, and that reaches its most deadly stage in Auschwitz, not in 1941 or 1942, but towards the end of the war, in spring and summer 1944, when huge numbers of Hungarian Jews arrive, um, and in a matter of months, um, several hundred thousand of them are, are murdered in Auschwitz. So this is a time when literally you have daily, uh, often daily, sometimes two or three of these transports, uh, deportation transports arriving, thousands being killed every day. Auschwitz, as Essmann, can kill more or less with impunity at this point. And yet, I also found a document in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, dated from 1944, of the Auschwitz administration applying to headquarters in Berlin to have a prisoner whipped. And this is a form which has to be filled out in triplicate, kind of the offense, the alleged offense of the prisoner has to be written down. This is then sent off to Berlin where an official looks at it, decides what kind of, how many lashes are appropriate for this punishment. This gets stamped and then sent back. And then months later, the prisoner is punished for the supposed <coughs> infraction. So this goes on at the same time as SS man at the ramp, ramp in Auschwitz beat people to death or forced them into the gas chambers. This document from the USHMM is just one of hundreds of thousands of records. Um, I mean, uh, Roger men mentioned the mountains of, of, of evidence. The perpetrators leave a huge paper trail uh, in the camps, but big as this mountain seems to us, most of the material did not survive. Um, the SS was by no means as efficient as people always believe, but they were pretty good at destroying their own evidence of their crimes. This is what they do in the headquarters in Berlin in 1945, and this is what they do in pretty much all of the camps around the country as well. And the remainder of perpetrator documents is dispersed, scattered, across a huge number of different archives. I'll give you one example. I mean, the, the very important files of the SS, Auschwitz SS construction office, these were the officials who planned and built the uh, crematorium and gas chamber complex in Birkenau. These files were thought lost and were only found in the 1990s in the special archive in Moscow. Um, and I'm sure there is still material out there waiting to be discovered. So perpetrator materials, SS generated materials from the time is a hugely important source. Um, another, a second very important source derives from post-war trials. Now there can't be any doubt that post-war justice for crimes in the camps was an overall failure. You only have to look at the recent case against the former Auschwitz camp official Oskar Gröning. Um, the so-called bookkeeper of Auschwitz. I'm not quite sure who came up with that name because it elevates his position. Uh, I mean, he was, that was a, you know, he was a small kind of rank-and-file official <coughs> working in the administration office in, in Auschwitz. And Gröning is in his 90s a few months ago. He was in his 90s when he was finally sentenced um, to four years in prison for crimes he had committed more than 70 years ago. Um, and that is a success story because actually the great majority of former Auschwitz officials were never caught and tried. Uh, according to um, research by my colleagues in, in, in Auschwitz at the memorial, um, perhaps 85% of Auschwitz guards and other officials who survived the war never tried. 
depressing as this story of late or failed justice is, it slightly obscures the fact that there were a huge number of trials very early on after the war, in the early months and years after liberation. And the largest site for these trials were a place that a lot of these SS officials on trial knew incredibly well, because it was Dachau. The Americans take over Dachau and turn it into a um, internment camp, and also set up a, the largest court dealing with concentration camp crimes. So between 1945 and 47, um, they prosecute some maybe a thousand defendants there for crimes in the camps. And the records from these early trials in the archives are incredibly important for historians because it is very often the only time that these perpetrators speak after the war. If they could, they kind of disappeared quietly and tried to forget about the camps. Now, obviously, as in the case of all other historical documents, this material, these perpetrator um, records, uh, the defense they give, um, has to be studied with great care. These uh, officials generally portray themselves as soldiers, honorable men who'd just done their duty. Uh, and this uh, is sometimes taken to absolutely absurd lengths, as in the case of Arthur Lieberhenschel, who was one of the commandants of Auschwitz, who claims in an interrogation, I think in 1946, that he had no idea that anybody was gassed in, in Auschwitz. He had no idea that there were any gas chambers. Um, maybe Irving took his cue from Leverhensch. Um Still reading between the lines of this testimony by the perpetrators post-45 allows us glimpses into their mind. And some of them are surprisingly candid, none perhaps more so than Rudolf Hess, the first commandant of Auschwitz, who talks very openly about mass murder, about what made him a mass murderer, and also about how the Holocaust developed in Auschwitz. Uh, one thing you shouldn't look for, though, in his writings is contrition. Um, Hess remains a Nazi to the end, and his greatest regret, if you read his several memoirs, uh, is not that uh, he committed these terrible crimes, but that he didn't fulfill his dream of becoming a farmer. <laughs> Other, so, I mean, this is, this is, this is, um, you know, a, a, one of the examples for perpetrator testimony, and I tried in the book as much as I could to understand what drove and motivated these, these men and women. One of the conclusions I came up with is that there isn't a typical perpetrator, just as there isn't a typical prisoner. Let me turn to, to prisoners, and that's the final third big uh, corpus of testimony that's important, um, the testimony of, of inmates. And I've drawn in the book as much as I could on first-hand testimony, some of it actually written inside the camp. Stanley mentioned uh, the quote at the beginning of the book written by a Jewish prisoner from the Sonderkommando in Auschwitz. These were those prisoners who were forced by the SS to work at the gas chambers at the crematoria in Birkenau, and a number of them found the courage and the time um, and the facility to write letters, notes, which they're buried on the campgrounds. And some of these have been found after the war. Some have not. Um, and this is an important source for historians. Other prisoners keep secret diaries. I've already mentioned this before. Other prisoners, again, who work as scribes, for example, copy uh, SS records, uh, which are preserved in that way. And many more men, women, and children speak after liberation. There wasn't um, a collective silence after the war, as has sometimes been said. Um, as my colleague, um, who very sadly passed away yesterday, David Cesarani, a very important historian of the Holocaust, as David pointed out, he called it a myth of silence. Um, many survivors speak out almost as soon as they are liberated, uh, in the first weeks and months after the Allies arrive. And this is crucial material for historians, not yet, and not least because it's not yet overlaid by collective memories of the camps. Some of this material is published, and some of it I'm sure you've read. The great bulk of it lies in archives and has never been published, recorded by private individuals, 
by psychologists, by historical commissions, Jewish organizations, legal officials, but they also are created in other contexts. I was thinking about this um, kind of before when Roger was talking, you mentioned the case of Moritz Choinovsky, who's that uh, a prisoner, Polish <coughs> born, who is liberated in, 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 Auschwitz, uh, in Dachau in 1945. And I knew of him and his case and his liberation because of the diaries of a Dachau inmate, Edgar Kupfer, who Albert knows. Um, and Kupfer writes about, he's a German inmate who keeps a secret diary, and he writes 1,800 pages in secret in, in Dachau doing the law. And Kupfer writes day, day by day, kind of sometimes hourly uh, uh, reports about what's going on in the camp, an incredibly valuable resource as well. And Kupfer talks about the moment of liberation, and he talks about how he hugs Chonovsky and how they kiss. So I knew the story from Kupfer's perspective, recorded at the time. But then I hunted and hunted and hunted for Chonovsky's story. And kind of eventually I found a granddaughter somewhere who then led me somewhere else. And in the end, kind of the long time of looking, I found his restitution file, which is still sitting in the Munich restitution office, not an archive. And, you know, I was the first historian to be able to look at it. And, and, and through that, I got his voice and his story. Um, and he ends up kind of in America uh, in, in, in kind of, and I think he, he dies in Toledo in, in, in the early 1970s. Um, but this testimony and these survivor accounts are obviously absolutely essential um, for trying to write a history as comprehensive as this. And it would be impossible to do this without working in camp memorial archives. A lot of the most important material is held in memorial archives, and they've become a central place for historical research. They hold sometimes original documents. Albert will say more about this, no doubt. Um, they have copies of documents held elsewhere, testimonies. They also have built up in recent years prisoner databases, which are incredibly important and useful for historians. So to tell the story of the camps as a whole, uh, it's necessary to work in a number of different archives. Um, during the course of the Third Reich, the Nazis set up a total of 27 main camps with 1,100 or more attached satellite camps. And so that by the middle of the war, you have a huge, dense system of camps all across Nazi-controlled Europe, from the Far East, from the Baltic States, all the way to Alderney, a small uh, island in the, in, the, in the British Channel. Um, and there isn't a typical camp. Camps take on different forms at different times, their function changes. So to write a history of the camps, you have to look at a variety of different sites. And yet, among all of these different camps, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of camps, Dachau holds a very special place. And it's no coincidence that the book begins and ends in Dachau. It begins in Dachau because Dachau was the first SS camp, set up just weeks after Hitler's appointment as Chancellor. And a prisoner from 1945, when the camp reaches the last circle of hell, you're familiar with the photographs taken by the liberators, a prisoner from 45 would have never ever recognized the camp as it stood in 1933. Um, then it was just a broken down building uh, uh, at a dilapidated munitions plant in Dachau. On the first day, there were not thousands, a tenth of thousands of prisoners, but a few, 100, 120. They're not prisoners from all over Europe. There are local communists, by and large. And they're not uh, beaten or tortured. They're treated fairly decently uh, and sleep in the same building as the guards. Uh, and few of them expect to stay for very long. None of them, not the guards, not the prisoners, could have guessed that Dachau would become the birthplace of a huge and sprawling camp complex. These early camps like Dachau are set up uh, hastily, improvised, and they have one function, which they all share, and that function is to crush the political opposition in Germany. Um, so the Nazis grab whatever spaces they can to set up these sites, ships, bars, sports grounds, um, hotels and <coughs> derelict factories like Dachau. Crucially, almost all of these early camps disappear again in a matter of months 
as do almost all of the prisoners. <coughs> and there is an extraordinary moment, I don't want to talk about it now because I've already strained your patience, but there's an extraordinary moment about 18 months into Hitler's rule where there's a real chance that these camps will disappear. They don't because Hitler sees the benefits of lawless terror and supports the creation of this SS system. And Dachau plays the central part in the creation of this system. Dachau is the model camp of SS leader Heinrich Himmler. He loves to show Nazi leaders around Dachau, kind of, and, and there are many visits of dignitaries, bigwigs of the Nazi state, uh, though not Hitler, um, in Dachau. It's a Dachau that the SS works out what a concentration camp is in Nazi Germany. It's worth bearing in mind that when the Nazis come to power, they don't have a master plan for these camps. Uh, they don't have a master, master plan for many things, it, it, it has to be said. So this is why these different early camps look so different. And this is why there is such variation. And it is the model in Dachau that uh, stands at the center of this invention of the concentration camp as uh, the Nazis see it. So the Nazis invent their version of the concentration camp in Dachau. Um, it is here that they work out how prisoners should be treated, and that is as enemies of the state. It is here that they work out the rules and regulations. It's here that they work out the staffing and the organization of these camps, the structure of these camps. Uh, and it is that model that is then extended to other camps um, in the coming years. And Dachau becomes or is a school of violence, as we also heard before, for a number of men who later become leading figures, leading commandants like Hess, who first arrives in, 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 in Dachau in late 1934 and very quickly rises up the ranks. So Dachau is central to any history of the camps. And it's a great stroke of luck for us historians that the archive there is in such expert hands. Alert has been extremely helpful, far, far beyond the call of, of, of duty, um, during uh, the uh, long process, the many years of my project with kind of, you know, I don't know how many documents you kind of scanned and sent me at very short notice. But he's been incredibly helpful in exactly the same way to a small army of my PhD students, which I sent to Dachau, as well, and to many other researchers who've, who've come there over the years. And I'm quite aware of the fact that helping historians uh, is only one part of your difficult job. The achievements of, of Albert are particularly impressive if we reflect, and that's the last thought I'm going to leave you with, uh, if we reflect on the history of memorials like Dachau, and I'm sure Albert is going to say a little bit more about that later. But it's worth stressing now that even a few decades ago, kind of, it looked quite plausible that the history of Dachau as a site, as a space, as a locality, would disappear and be forgotten, be buried quite literally. What happens in Dachau? once the American trials end, is that the Bavarian authorities turn the former prisoner compound into a housing project for ethnic German refugees from Eastern Europe. So the Dachau barracks, where thousands of prisoners had suffered and died, are turned into apartments. <coughs> the infirmary is turned into a kindergarten, and the delousing block uh, is turned into a restaurant, which is later called at the crematorium. <laughs> <laughs> For years, the history of the camp is obscured by this settlement, and for the most part of the 1950s, there isn't even a rudimentary museum on the site in Dachau. The history of the camp, of this place, is covered up by the town of Dachau, which is very keen to shed any association with the camp, and it's ignored by the Bavarian state. And I think maybe it's nice to leave things after a talk which is necessarily dealing with some of the worst periods and stories um, in the recent past. Maybe it's, it's, it's good to end with a slightly positive note, and that is, look at the memorial today. I mean, things couldn't be much uh, different. As the memory of Nazism has changed in post-war Germany, 
so has the place and the significance of these memorials. State and town authorities in Dachau now work closely with the Camp Memorial and the Prisoner Association. I'm sure there's still tensions, but it's completely different to what it would have been 40, 50 years ago. Um, I hope Albert is nodding. Um, <laughs> there was once a void of memory. Um, people didn't even know if you took a train to Dachau how you would get to the camp. And now you have some 30 yeah. academic staff, archival staff, <coughs> pedagogic staff working in Dachau, and they are dedicated to preserving the history of Dachau and to deepen our understanding of <coughs> the camp and its place in the Third Reich. And at the heart of that endeavor stands the archive and Albert Knoll, and I'm delighted that you're all here to honor Albert's wonderful work tonight. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear Mr. Cohen, dear Nick Waxman, dear friends, I want to thank you for your kindness to invite me to New York. It's a so great honor for me. I was overwhelmed when Nick telephoned in May to ask me if I accepted honor. I asked back, what's all around it? Uh, and uh, uh, when he continued that it turns around the Archivist of the Year prize, of the Stone Foundation, I was a little bit perplexed and incredul incredulous. What? Who? Where? <laughs> After a few minutes, he convinced me, and I said, yes. <laughs> you must understand that over all uh, the years which I worked with him intensively, I always trusted his words, so I did a uh, half year ago, and from that point on, I do not repent my decision. <laughs> Okay, uh, Nick has, uh, has lost a lot of words about Dachau and I think uh, I will uh, press them in, in a few 20 minutes words <laughs> uh, and I brought with me some, uh, some pictures to, yes, to illustrate that story. Yes, again, it's a great honor for me and also for, for my colleagues from Dachau, especially Dirk uh, Riedel, who worked together with me. <coughs> when he started researching about the early history of Dachau concentration camp, when he asked for documents, photographs, information about the prisoners who were persecuted as social democrats, as communists, when he asked for as expert researches in our database, when he asked for information about the perpetrators, the SS men who developed the camp in a few weeks in spring 1943 from the first Bavarian concentration camp into a prototype and a model for all the other concentration camps, and at least <coughs> it turned into a death camp. When Nick asked for all that information, he arrived in our archive well prepared. It needed only a few minutes to find together. And so, and, uh, and, uh, and a very productive and successful work began. It was the same with his students like Kim Wünschmann, Chris Dillen, and Paul Moore. They all now finished their dissertation, and I'm proud like a father of his children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nick's wonderful book and uh, all the other books that have been written uh, in the years before couldn't have been realized without the will to survive of the former prisoners. More than 60,000 of them succeeded in their struggle against the daily terror of the SS, against hunger, coldness, and cruel diseases. I am happy that one of the Dachau survivors, Wolf Prensky, um, Wolf Prensky is among us. Later, I would like him ask, to, ask him to spend some words on the stage. Uh, no, I'd like to go on. Yes. In the last days before the liberation, when the prisoners had, um, had to watch how the SS destroyed all the documents, nearly all the documents, that they, uh, that they could catch in the big fire, thank you, they decided by risking their lives to collect and to rescue as much as they were able to. This was the base of the Dachau archive. Now, about 95% of the 200,000 prisoners are known by name, and more. We do not know only their names, 
you know, the categories of imprisonment, the nationalities, the begin and the end of the imprisonment in Dachau, the destination from where and to, uh, and to where the prisoners were sent, the subcamps uh, where they had to work, and the SS men who commanded that camps. That's a lot of information which is combined in a database so that Nick and other scientists got statistics from us that helped them to come to a valid and well-founded results. Let me start again. On uh, April 29th in 1945, at the same time when General Henning Linden led uh, a, a, a detachment of the 42nd Infantry Division, the so-called Rainbow Division, to Dachau, at the same time, 10,000 prisoners were forced on death marches towards the Alps, you see it on the right side, where Nazis believed to find a place that could be defended against the Allies. A senseless venture which cost the life of hundreds who hoped to survive. After the liberation, the US administration organized food and health care, but more than 2,000 former prisoners uh, did not survive the two first months. Afterwards, the homelands of the survivors uh, this is uh, for the Western Hemisphere, organized the repatriation. Here you can see on the left side the Belgian repatriation. After years, they were lucky to see their families. Jewish survivors realized that their families vanished in the Holocaust. They remained in DP camps and tried to immigrate to Israel, US, USA and other countries. US administration in Bavaria stated, started trials against the SS men, you see it on the right side, and other offenders who were <coughs> accused for serious crimes against humanity. The trials began in November 1945. Yeah. Several heavily incriminated persons were sentenced to death. After another 250 trials, the US internment camp on the area of the Firmer concentration camp was closed in 1948. But the US Army remained on the ground of the former SS area and used the casernes and barracks to house their soldiers. This was until 1972. Nick just mentioned, after 1948, German ex-police from Sudetenland and other parts of mid-east middle Europe settled in the barracks. You see it on the left side. Schools, churches, craft shops, pubs, grocery stores and post offices moved into the buildings. The former concentration camp became the settlement Dachau East. Some few survivors tried to keep the remembrance uh, of to the Nazi camp vivid. They held commemoration ceremonies for example, at the 9th of November, the anniversary of the anti-Jewish pogroms in Germany. You see it on the right side, this is a picture from the early 1950s. Only the area around the crematory was reserved for visitors. A small exhibition was shown in the room of the crematory and the room beneath. You can see it on the, on the left side, it is the exhibition from the 50s. The intention of that early exhibitions was to demonstrate the terror of the Nazi regime and to disprove the deniers which, with meaningful pictures. Thousands of visitors came every year to see the remains of the camp. This was also in the 50s and in the 1960s. You can see it on the left side. Uh, the old barracks are still existing on that photos. The, the barracks uh, vanished uh, around 1963-1964. Yes, they came to, uh, to see the remains of the camp, whereas the town of Dachau, in coordination with the government of Bavaria, pursued the idea to demolish all the buildings and to give rise to an industrial area. 
Thanks to the protest of the International Dachau Committee and thanks to the survivors who remained in situ, like Father Leonhard Roth, you see him in the middle of the group on the right side. He was a priest who was imprisoned in Dachau for three years, <coughs> who made guided tours as often as he could do. Thanks to all of them, the partially demol demolished demolishment was stopped and most of the stone buildings of the prisoners' camp were rescued. Only the prisoner barracks, whose substance had been greatly changed, were destroyed. Survivors like Otto Kullhofer from West Germany, Karl Horn from East Germany, Stanislav Samicznik from Czechoslovakia, Jan Domagala from Poland, Oskar Winter, a Jewish survivor who uh, immigrated to London, Eugene Ost from Luxembourg, Hans Schwarz uh, from Vienna. They all tried to preserve documents from the Dachau concentration camp that they had hidden before the eyes of the SS. From 1945 uh, on, the, on, the International Int uh, Information Office produced new name lists and index cards in order to provide a confirmation of imprisonment. You see it on the left side, the Polish survivor Walter Czislik uh, at his work. He stayed at Dachau until 1947, so uh, his family expected him to come home, but uh, he uh, felt it his, at his duty to stay in Dachau to help the other prisoners. Um, <coughs> yes, this is the cornerstone of our database, the legacy of the Polish survivor Walter Czislik, for example, who had to work as a camp writer until 45, is now one of the most important documents of our archive. We got his uh, nachlass. His <coughs> yeah, this is Edgar Kupfer Kubowitz, <laughs> whom Nick uh, mentioned before. Altogether. More than 45,000, um, no, excuse me, <laughs> I just jumped. Diaries and, uh, of the prisoners had uh, the same importance, for example, the German poet and writer Edgar kupfer kobowitz born in 1906 in Silesia. He left Germany in 1934 towards Paris, where he earned his life with hand weaving. In 1937, he took the chance to settle in Italy uh, on the island of Ischia. He wrote books of, about the archaic population structure and he was fascinated of the simple life of the farmers and fishermen. In autumn 1940, he was denounced <coughs> to have been expressed himself disparagingly about the Reich. He was arrested and handed over to the Gestapo who brought him to Dachau. Some months later, he was sent to KZ Neuengamme, close to Hamburg, where he had to do very hard work in winter in a sub-camp in the open air. <coughs> he fell sick, he lost weight down to 44 kilograms. <coughs> Nevertheless, he, um, he, as a convinced vegetarian, refused to eat meat wherever, also the rare portions of meat in the camp soup. He thought of suicide, but he was lucky to came back to Dachau. Two years later, in November 42, he had the chance, the chance to start a secret camp diary. On 1,300 pages, he wrote down what happened in the camp in the last two years. And from November 1942 on, uh, until the liberation, he noticed, he noticed uh, everything he had seen and heard from the others day by day. Altogether, nearly 2,000 pages with, with utmost details, detailed information were the base of his book Als Häftling in Dachau, as a prisoner in Dachau, published in 1956. You can see uh, the hidden diaries which had been rescued <coughs> months after he came back to Dachau. He was very disappointed when he realized that nearly nobody was interested in this book. There was no interest in, no, in post-war Germany, <coughs> Germany 
People tried to forget the Nazi era. Of course, lots of them had been involved in what happened at that time. The production of lots of cassette memoirs, like the SS estate of Eugen Bogon and Dachau by Hans Karls, both published in 1946, this sank down in the 1950s to zero. Kupfer Kobanowitz resigned, went into the States, later withdrew to Italy. He led a very simple life on Sardinia and died in Germany in 1991. He was totally forgotten. Some few years later, the interest in literature about Dachau began to rise, and six years after his death, <coughs> the Dachau Diaries came out by a well-known publisher. Twenty years after the liberation, in the beginning of May 1965, the museum of the Dachau Memorial site was opened, and for the first time, the history of that place was shown in a large exhibition. It was the knowledge of the political prisoners who never gave up to tell the story of resistance against the National Socialism and of racial, political and religious um, persecution. This was the first KL cassette exhibition in West Germany. At the same time, a first archive was installed in Dachau. The survivors who were actively engaged in the foundation of the first collection had no interest in the fate of individuals. Their focus was based primarily on, document, on documentary nature. No biographies were shown in the first exhibition, which you can see on the right side. The persecution had been reproduced as a collective fate. From the 1980s on, more and more individual documents came to us, and from that point on, visitors were more and more interested, interested in the fate of the single prisoners. The survivors themselves were the first to start audio interviews with their camp colleagues. This was in the beginning of the 1970s. Nowadays, interviews are an important means to understand and to interpret the history of the camp. Steven Spielberg did a great job when he started 20 years ago the Shoah Foundation. In Dachau it is my job and that of my colleagues to ask as much interviewees as we could find, like also Mr. Prensky. <laughs> From the 1990s on, Dachau introduced the electronic data processing and in 1995-96 the data of more than 170,000 prisoners were digitized. In the meantime, we got new sources, and till now, the number uh, increased to 192,500. In 1997, a scientific department was installed, and this was the time when I started my work in the archive. I decided to hold on the structure of the archive and library, which maintained from the 1960s and 70s on. But now, we had the technical means to install a database on the one hand, including all the information about the prisoners from various sources and on, uh, and on uh, other all data from, from all over the archive of the library. In a few seconds, we can find out everything about the prisoner, but also about the SS men on one glimpse of the screen. As there is a continuous acquisition of documents and copies from other archives, we have about 5% originals and 95% copies from other archives <coughs> and private collections, we found um, that, this, that it is another Im very important step to modernize the archive, to digitize all the original documents. D during the next weeks, Approximately 20,000 pages from the estates from several prisoners will be scanned and together with my small staff uh, we try to organize that in a, in a short time these pages will be accessible for the visitors in the intranet. Altogether there are more than 44,000 archival units, among them more than 10,000 paper documents this means, uh, this extends from a single sheet up to a collection of several thousand pages. Among them, 
um, are more than 10,000 photographs, 1,200 films, videos and audios, more than 250 ground and building plans, more than 500 posters, and more than 700 objects. You see it's a small archive. Every year, 400 to 800 single objects or documents were purchased from the archive. Our library is a reference library with 16,700 books. Of course, we are specialized in books about Dachau and other concentration camps in any language. It starts chronologically with the first book of a Dachau prisoner, Hans Beimler's in Mörderlager Dachau, in the murderer camp of Dachau, published in Moscow in autumn 1933. Besides this, the library houses lots of memoirs of survivors and liberators, scientific discourses about National Socialism and the Second World War, about persecution, resistance, emigration, Jewish history and the Holocaust, history of the memorial site and last but not least, political education. By the way, in December I will present my recently book to the public, The Story of the Pink Triangle Memorial Stone in Dachau, and the 10-year struggle of the Munich homosexual groups from 1985 to 1995, for getting the allowance to install the stone inside the museum of the memorial site. In the appendix, there is a long list of the names of those who were the Pink Triangle in Dachau and who didn't survive. In the last decades, we were able to collect lots of objects who had been found in the area of the former camp, either in the prisoner camp or in the SS compound of the subcamps. For example, we have got some concrete stones from subcamp Kaufering, that's the story of Mr. Pransky, which had been used for proof the stability of the concrete. With that concrete, the SS forced the prisoners to build, a gigantic, to build up gigantic bunkers, which gave shelter for the production of details of rockets and aeroplanes. When Mr. Pransky visited the memorial site some years ago, I showed him that stone, and he remembered that it was him to produce that stone, 70 years ago. But we collect also prisoner clothes, like this of Bernhard Quandt, he, a, a political prisoner in Dachau from 1940 on till the liberation, who later became minister president of the state of Mecklenburg in German Democratic Republic. You see him on the uh, base uh, photography. Visitors like uh, uh, the friends of Bernhard Quandt, but also like Nick Waxman and Around 500 others came to the archive every year. Relative of, relatives of victims who asked us many questions about the items that had not been spoken about in their families. And sometimes a survivor like Wolf Premsky came to us just by chance. A broad variety of photographs is stored in our archive. More than 10,000 photographs are representing the history of the camp its prisoners and perpetrators, the exhumation of the dead bodies, the buildings and the post-war using of the area. Private photos are beneath police photos and propaganda photos as the SS abused, on the next side you can see this, as the SS abused the faces of the prisoners, for example, for the anti-Semitic exhibition Der Ewige Jude, the internal Jew. You see the poster of that exhibition, which had been opened in autumn 1938 in Vienna, uh, with the faces of the Dachau prisoners who had been brought to Dachau just short after the uh, Anschluss of uh, Austria to, uh, to Germany in April 1938. To show the biographies, of the victims, it is important to collect private photos, like this of Ludwig Menner, a photo which shows him in July 1933, five weeks after he was released from the Dachau concentration camp, where he was imprisoned 
uh, of political reasons, and he wrote down five weeks after KZ Dachau, the hair began <coughs> began to, to grow again, which had been uh, uh, put away at the time when he was imprisoned. The most important documents are prisoner lists that had been produced in an unbelievable high amount. The Camp SS was very eager to have a total control over everything. But it was the duty of the prisoner writers to serve every evening a correct bundle of lists without any inconsistency. Several of that lists were hidden so that we are able to reconstruct the data of more than 95% of the prisoners. To save the documents uh, was very risky and even in the last days of the war, the prisoners run the risk to lose their life. <clears throat> they would have been caught by hiding documents, like the fever charts, which you can see on the left side of the malaria experimental station, saved by Eugene Ost, a prisoner from Luxembourg. It is unbelievable that nice drawings and paintings, like the plants of the so-called plantage, an agricultural testing area had been carried out, while some few meters beneath, others died of starvation, diseases and brutal ill-treatment. Karel Kaszak, a Czech prisoner, and other botanical, botanical painters were lucky to survive because Heinrich Himmler loved their artist work. See him on the left side. The simultaneity of, on the one hand, preferential treatment and death, hope and desperation accompanied the, sur the survivors through their lives, through their whole further life. For some of them, it was an effective remedy to start to paint whenever they felt overwhelmed of the remembrance. We showed the paintings of several, in several exhibitions in our museum, and you can see here some post-war paintings, some, some examples. <coughs> I will come to an end. Over 1,400 requests come every year to the memorial site. Relatives send us emails, write us letters, or visit us. <coughs> By using the database, complex researches are possible. More than two-thirds of all requests could have been answered positive. To finish the pre presentation uh, of a few uh, of a very varied job of an archivist, I want to point out that all that uh, uh, I, I, I want to point out that all the interviews with the survivors, one example, the Dutch survivor, that I made in the last years gave me a deep insight from various points to view into the history of the Dachau concentration camp. I hope that my lecture helped you to understand a little bit more of the cosmos of the concentration camp and how we, the descendants, <coughs> try to protect the remembrance. Now, I want to introduce Wolf Prensky, and I would like him to ask to come up to the stage Born in Christmas 1929 in Königsberg, East Russia, uh, when he, uh, when uh, life of the Jews was repressed more and more under the Nazis, <coughs> Pransky's family left Germany. He grew up in Lithuania, which became part of the Soviet Union. When Germany attacked Soviet Union and conquered Kovno, Wolf's father fled to Russia, and he and the rest of the family came into the ghetto. His sister was killed in the selections. When the ghetto was liquidated, he, his elder sister, which we met yesterday, his mother and his uncle came to KZ Stutthof, where they were separated. It's nearly unbelievable that these four persons survived. Please vote. Thank you very much. I didn't quite expect it, but it's OK. <laughs> uh, I actually came to use his uh, help 
on the other very simple little problem. I don't, I, I'm not the historian, I'm, I'm a PhD in biology, and I came to this country very <coughs> shortly, about a year and a half after the war. I was in Dachau for, uh, the president of Dachau for 10 months until my, <coughs> until my liberation. And all the papers that I had, all, all my ID and everything was based on the record that, that Dachau had on me. When I came there, I was a 14-year-old boy, I was very uh, short, small. Uh, in the ghetto, before that, the children were taken away and killed. I happened to be hidden for a while, then I worked in the shop and got around it. So I came, I was rather sensitive about my age and whatnot. When they interviewed me about my rap and my name and who I was, I decided I should make myself a little older. So they gave me. So I decided I'll add two years to my to myself. And uh, then after the war, when I came to get ID based on the Dachau records, I asked the American sergeant there. I said, you know, do me a favor, please subtract two years from what you find. <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, no problem. And so he gave me my an envelope, closed thing. When I came home, looked at it, I found that he subtracted three years. <laughs> and suddenly I was a year younger than I was. <laughs> and well, I didn't take it too seriously. On the way to the States, a year later, almost a year and a half later, I, I was processed. The lady there in the uniform, I asked, asked her, I think, do me a favor, please change this because it's, it's wrong. Add a year or to, to, to my age. She says, Are you, what's the matter? Are, are you looking for trouble? Kid? <laughs> no, no, of course not. So anyhow, I realized that I came here with false documentation. <laughs> And so I, I decided better never tell anybody. In fact, I didn't even tell my, my future wife when we got married. She always thought that was a year different from where I was. <laughs> and uh, she was, uh, she decided she, uh, <coughs> that there was something wrong with me. I never would have mitzvah. And so she and my son, let me, he was 14 at the time. They decided I needed a mitzvah. I, and I wasn't really you know, ready for it, but so what they said is, why don't you go Saturday morning, was in the shoot, which I did, and uh, they called me to the car, and when I came home, there was a party that you have a mitzvah. <laughs> and so, anyhow, of course, I realized right away that they chose the wrong week. Because they were off by, it was off by a year. <laughs> it wasn't quite what it should be. So I had this concern, and when I was going to Germany a few years ago, I decided to stop by in Dachau, and I'd been there once, once many years earlier, uh, that I would like to see what document they had because I couldn't figure out how that error was made. I mean, first when I thought, I thought, well, that side must have been drawn, who knows what. And but it was, I just couldn't understand. And uh, so when I came, he had uh, <coughs> the papers for me. And on the way to, to look what he had for me, we, uh, we came to his office. On the walls, there were, there were cabinets around there. Behind the glass wall, the cabinets were something that I recognized. So what he had there, besides all the documents and papers and books and whatnot, he had a bunch of concrete cubes sitting there on the shelf. And uh, I recognized them. Uh, I went over to look at it. I mean, 
had concrete in the place. Uh, it turns out, or he found out later, that I, when I was in Dachau for about seven or eight months of the period, I used to make these darn things. And what I was working at, I was working for a testing station with two prisoners there, and I had to bring concrete that was being poured in this big, enormous underground uh, bunker that became an underground factory. And uh, they were taking, I would take samples of concrete, I mean, 40, 50 pounds, and carry them a couple hundred yards to the place where we analyze the stuff. And one of the things that we made is uh, these cubes, which were stored and then crushed on the, on the on, on a, a, a oil press, decide how good they are. Basically, it was a quality control type thing. And I come to Dachau, and here I see a bunch of them, four or five later on. And of course, some of came closer. He asked me what I was doing. I said, well, I look at it. I, I'm interested in this thing. And I asked him if I could look at him. He said, do you, do you know anything about him? Well, I have to say yes. And uh, he said, did you, well, you know, well, I, I, was make, I was making things. He said, did you make these? I says, I'd have to take him out and take a look. And what do you want to see? I want to see the date. Because I knew that every one of them were dated. Uh, because we kept them for 36 to 90 days, so we had to date some of them. And, so forth. So whatever he had. <clears throat> he, in the meantime, when he collected them, he made sure he collected the ones with the latest dates. And I looked at them. I, he said, did you make this? I said, this one I did not. Because this said April 23 or 24. And I said, by April 5, I was half dead. And so I couldn't have been there. Or I was, I somebody, a guard had hit me with a rifle butt on my head, and I uh, came down with meningitis. Uh, we, uh, the camp did not have any, anything to take me with. I had an uncle who was a minor cop there, who was very, very good at dealing with guards and people uh, like that. Uh, he was in the ghetto. And now in transportation camp, he found a way to talk somebody in to get me sulfur drugs from, from the pharmacy in Landsberg. And uh, the Jewish uh, doctors who were there treated me with it, and I, I survived. I know it was a sulfur drug because a couple of years ago, I had something done on me in the game of sulfur drug, and there was and, and, and I couldn't, I, I, I was allergic to it. And suddenly I realized <laughs> the source of my allergy was that out. Anyhow, the thing that, the uh, reason I, 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 I was interested in this thing here is that I found what he was doing is he had, when he collected them, he collected them by date, and, and he took the, la <coughs> the ones that were the last days of the war and had them there as a record of what really happened. You know what they were for, and so uh, this was new to him, what I taught him, so I got my birthday right and he got his concrete right. <laughs> And so we both, I think, I'm standing here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll quit right here. Thank you.